our attention is going to turn to what's our spiritual practice? How do we keep growing in our spiritual practices? You know, I think a lot of times we think of, uh, you know, spiritual disciplines and practices as prayer and going to liturgy and spiritual reading and all that, but we're talking about the spiritual discipline or practice now, praxis of forgiveness, okay? Something it takes a lifetime to get good at with God's grace. Um, so as I share with you a couple of thoughts about interpersonal reconciliation, tomorrow Father Nesty's going to talk about cosmic reconciliation. To that I'd like to say good luck. <laughs> but I am talking about how do we practice forgiveness, reconciliation in a, a lot of our one-on-one, -on -one, okay? And so I would like you to hear me, not as intending to tell you something you don't already know. Because as I look around the room and know many of you, I know what people of faith are, and, and I've heard some of your stories in different faiths and sharing studies, and I know you are living this. So my intent of going over some of this with you is not to tell you something you don't know, but maybe to just raise awareness of certain parts of the process, number one. And even more than that, that we look at this together so that we might strengthen each other as a community of believers who practice more intentionally reconciliation in its fullness. Okay, so just want to be clear about what my thinking is as I begin. So I want to touch on just a few thoughts uh, and they'll follow these lines. That when I think about this process of reconciliation, I think it's helpful to say that first there's the forgiveness piece, which is dealing with our own <coughs> blood that's been shed. A wound, a stab, uh, an offense, that there's some wounding that we have experienced if we are struggling with the call to reconciliation, right? Something's happened. John Shea always says, first something happens. <laughs> first something happens. So when I speak about forgiveness, in the first piece, I'm speaking about dealing with our own blood that's been shed, and then sweating to love as Christ, okay? So our own blood is sweating to love as Christ, the kind of the tension between the reaction to our woundedness and the Lord's call of what to do with that wound, okay? So that, that's the first piece. Now, what I've been getting, the more our little team has been working on this, is that that's pretty familiar to me. And as I think, that's pretty familiar us as people of faith. There's meaning than what the Lord says. There's meaning than what the Lord says. Okay? But it's really easy to think that forgiveness, the process of forgiveness stops there. And I think that's what we're trying to highlight and bring to consciousness, that reconciliation is more than just that kind of forgiveness. I mean, there are two different words, forgiveness, reconciliation. Forgiveness is one piece of the reconciliation process. We're called not just to forgiveness, we're called to reconciliation. And so uh, I just want, that's what I'm trying to do is break the pieces up a little bit. And so after forgiveness is the call to move towards, and we instead of mercy there, we could say the, it's, the next piece is compassion and mercy, that we find the tears of compassion, that we move on, and as we come to honor our own wound as the Lord honors us and then guides us in how to live with us, then, and I know you do this in your own experience, but then the call is to think about how does my woundedness really help me understand the other and many others, okay? So in a way, it's the movement from that blood dripping and blood and then sweating what to do with that, what the Lord's trying to uh, uh, draw in me, from me, to towards himself. And then there's the movement really towards empathy. <coughs> empathy where I, that wonderful experience, that wonderful experience of suffering and wrestling with it, that wonderful happy fault, then gives me an empathy 
for the other and for all humanity. So the other and all humanity. And that when I can have a tear for someone else, sometimes I really struggle. When I have clients, they'll tell me a story, they'll start, they'll start crying and think, oh God, bad therapist, bad therapist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just pulls at your heart. And you know, when someone tells you something and I'm like, I'm not supposed to cry, I'm not supposed to cry, and I'm not, eh, you know. <laughs> that I try to tell myself, if my tears are becoming a distraction to the other, that's not good. But frankly, sometimes when I tell something that I'm wrestling with and it's painful, if they don't have any tears, I'm a little miffed. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so, okay, so mercy, compassion, and mercy, that our movement in that dripping blood and that stretching, wrestling, being comforted by the Lord, not just wrestling with the Lord, but being comforted by him and then wrestling with what he asks um, in that experience is meant to then move us towards an empathy so that we have compassion with the other and many others. And that in that compassion, which is a kind of a tear for other people's sorrows because you know sorrow, they're suffering because you know suffering, then we get a little glimpse into the tear of God, which is the quality of mercy. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, mercy. Father Nesta gave me a wonderful little book to read, and he talked about how mercy is a divine quality and attribute, that we really don't exercise mercy. Mercy can only come from God. Okay, and I'm going to just say a little bit more about that, the relationship between compassion and mercy, okay? And that we move from that forgiveness to that compassion to that putting our compassion into the, the heart of God's mercy, and we move towards reconciliation, which means then we are called to give blood, you know, to write that letter, make that call, make that person the source of our constant prayer, that we go then, in the language of our little seminar here, from our blood being shed, you don't go from the first to the last, right? You need, we need to move through the, the different steps and the different parts of a, of a process of change and, and God's continuing to create us to giving blood and restoring relationships. Now, we're not going to have time, and it's not my intention to have a long debate on, well, if someone does something really terrible to you, do you have to become their best friend then? It's like, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say that quite so strongly, apparently. <laughs> but only you can decide, only you can decide what reconciliation means. But I think for a lot of times when we have this conversation and we hear the word reconciliation, it's like, well, I'll forgive them. Well, I can pray for them, but I don't want to have to get back with them. It's like, well, apparently there's still a lot more prayer that's needed. <laughs> you know, but you know, we don't have to assume it, but we ought not write it off because it's all about prayer and discernment. And what is God asking? And hopefully I can give a couple examples as we go along. So that's our focus for about the next half hour. And then we're going to give you some time really to pray on your own um, with some of the steps that I hope to, you know, break open a little bit. Okay? So it's computer genius here. Okay, so the practice, so where do we begin? The practice of forgiveness begins by meditating on being forgiven first, right? We start with being forgiven first. Even Immaculate in her own story, we, we, we meet her in the bathroom, but she met Christ long before that, right? She's already focused on that she has been loved first. And I love this little quote, just for your own uh, you know, reflection, put it in, there, in the back of your mind. The only motivation for forgiveness is gratitude. The only motivation, the only thing that's really going to help us forgive, that first piece of owning and naming our own wounds and being able to uh, move towards the Lord is the deep sense of gratitude. It's only when we realize our gratitude for the many times that God has forgiven us that we can forgive others. Now, I bet you're all sitting there thinking, I know that, right? That's right, I know that. So, when you're struggling with someone you need to forgive, 
Do you spend a lot of time there? I, I don't. Maybe some of you do. But it's almost as if we know it intellectually. But the process of rec forgiveness towards compassion and mercy and reconciliation is we really usually have to start by dwelling there. And most of us start with our wound and the knowledge of God rather than the memory of our own, uh, the, the living memory of our own life experience. I remember um, reading something about Mother Teresa's group and, and she, they said that when they had a really hard day ahead of them and they were nervous about some things, they would sit down and pray first for an hour. I think you ought to get busy. You know, you got a lot to do. But it was the whole idea that when there is a task before us, that's daunting, the most important thing to do, a spiritual practice, a spiritual discipline, is to start where we're supposed to start, to start in the only place that's going to let the process move, and that is, of course, to start with the, with the memory, the reflection on God's love and forgiveness for us first, okay? Okay, so forgiveness is given first. Um, and those are just different scriptures that you might um, keep in mind. I'm going to give you some time, as I said, after this to do a little bit of prayer around uh, some experience in your own life. But all the different ways we can think about God being first, that God is first in the world, that God is before all of life, uh, that it is God who chooses us, not that we who chose God. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Even if a mother forgets her baby or the child in her womb, I will never forget you. The, Father Ben talked about the image of the prodigal son, or some people refer to it, you know, as the extravagant father. He, now when you know, talks about how he runs out to meet the son. There again is the father's initiative. The father, God, always goes first. And nothing will be able to separate us from that love. I was thinking of a couple things that were said about, uh, you know, along these lines. And when we talk about culture, I think one of the biggest temptations in our, that has, sh uh, biggest shifts that has happened, and uh, so many writers tell us about this, and I love the writing of Mary Jo Letty. She talks about how in our culture, we have lost starting with God. Okay, we, and, and uh, Rollheiser says, we believe in God. And we, but, and we think God's great, but God is more like a serviceman whose card we keep in our wallet and say, he is really good. When you need something, you pull, you pull it out, <laughs> and you want to call on him. We love God. We think God's great, but that is not the same as the centrality of God. God is always first. And Mary Jo Letty has a wonderful little silly kind of example. She says, when you get, got up this morning, did you say, whew, I got up, or thank God I got up, or... Oh, I got up earlier, or I got up late. Or do you say, God woke me up this morning. No, she just uses it as a way to illustrate where's your awareness of the starting point. The starting point is always God. And so when we speak about reconciliation, we're reminding ourselves that the starting point is always God and dwelling, not just knowing that intellectually, but dwelling in that. Hmm? So forgiveness then asks us to move on, dwelling in that awareness of God's love, presence, covenant, forgiveness of us, mercy. Centered in that, we move towards recognizing and naming how our own blood has been shed. Hmm? Um, it's that task that we've referred to different times that we are called to break open our own feelings or wounds, our anger, our rage, our sense of loss, our sense of sadness, emptiness, betrayal, abandonment. Okay. Now, if you were to think of a continuum, some of us are great on naming it. As a matter of fact, a little less naming might be a good idea. Okay. <laughs> And on the other extreme is people who are saying, you know, it's not important. As Father Nessie said, let it go, let it go. It's not important. Instead of entering into the experience of our woundedness. You know, that can sound so narcissistic. Let's enter into our woundedness. And it is 
if that's the end product. It is narcissistic if it's the end product. But if it's going into the wounds that I might know where I'm bleeding, that I might know where I desperately need the Lord's love and healing and wisdom and spirit of forgiveness, it is one of the most intimate paths to holiness. Okay? But you know, there's cultural reactions to all that too, doing it or not doing it, if we're going to be extreme, right? Okay? But I think for the Christian, we need to say that forgiveness has to include recognizing and naming where we are. You know, years ago there was a great book. Did you ever read the book called Who Told You You Were Naked? Did you ever hear that book? It was a great little book. It was written by a, a Trappist monk. <laughs> he says, uh, he takes the story from um, Genesis, and he talks about how Adam, Adam and Eve, and they're in the garden, and they're having this great life, and they decide they don't have quite enough, so they're going to seize control. They want power, huh? But then after they do that, they're like, oh, my God, I'm in big, you know. So they, hide, they, they go to hide, and they're hiding behind the tree, or they're hiding behind the fig leaves. They're hiding. And so the monk, the author, Rob, um, I remember his first name, R-A-A-B is his last name. He says, that phrase that they say to God, um, we are naked. You know, we, we, you'll see us for who we are. You know, you'll see what we did. He, says, he takes that line and he says, Adam and Eve, humankind, we say, oh my God, look at who I am. Do we think God said, oh my God, I didn't know that. I didn't know who I made. I didn't know you were capable of that. You took control? Huh, what was I thinking when I made you? And he uses that whole image to say God knows who God made. God is not surprised at our sinfulness and our woundedness and our brokenness. We are. <laughs> we are because he, he, he talks, t touches on a little bit what Father Ben said about Gil Bailey and them. We know that we are capable of more. We know that we are not all that we can be. And we feel guilt about it. Whereas the Lord says, I'm, I'm not asking you to feel guilty. I'm asking you to become aware of the part of you that is your part in your creation. I'm asking you to become aware of all the sinfulness, the brokenness, the woundfulness. I want you to know you so that then you know you need me to become all that you're called to become, which is like Christ. Okay, so I like that story as a way of trying to talk about how the God knows our humanity. We need to know our humanity and to know that it is both a gift and a food and the path towards our own holiness and growth. Huh? Fine. Yeah. Uh huh. Is it possible for most of us to be able to? So once we open and look at anger, rage, loss, all those things, and understand what's causing that, I mean, I think you're saying we should try to meditate to understand that, but isn't often we can see the symptoms, but don't really know inside of us what's causing it? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's why we have therapists, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then a good therapist, and a lot of you are good therapists to yourselves and to your families, and, and it is. It's strange. Why am I so sad? Why am I so angry? What else can I learn about this? It doesn't mean, like if we go back to the story of the woman and the abuse and all that, it doesn't mean, of course, that the abuse isn't wrong and painful. But you see how she said, I took a lot of that because of stuff about me. I allowed it. She, she got that big view, and she owned what was her part in staying around for more of the abuse. Right. So definitely, and thank you, Mike, it's not just naming it, but I guess in my mind I, I, I just assume naming it means not just what you feel, but where it's coming from. Trying to, and the thing is sometimes we don't know. 
We don't know, and that's why we talk to people. And I don't mean just professionals. We talk to the people we love, and we talk to spiritual directors, and we talk to our friends, and we talk in faith communities, because we're trying to get some insight. You know, like even when Immaculate, when she gets to that point, says, they're children. They're children. And children do terrible things. And Father Ben made the reference. He said, you know, when children, when any of us as children don't have the coaching and the guidance, we become wounded individuals. And it just gets passed on from generation to generation. Huh? Yeah. So we try to understand it. But, if the, but obviously the narcissism is if we stop there. Okay. The danger is if we don't do it so that we can do the other pieces. Hmm? So, uh, you know, I think that sometimes the hardest thing, we're talking about feeling guilty about different things and how that puts us into an atonement mode. One of the things that human beings feel most guilty about is their feelings. Is their feelings. You know, like Cynthia talked a little bit about, you know, you know, how come, you know, I still struggle, and most of us can have situations where we still struggle, and yet the stories reminded us that the struggle goes on for years. But so many of us feel guilty that we're still struggling for years, as if that's a fault. Instead of saying, when there's been a terrible breach, and a terrible loss, and a terrible grief, it is likely it will take years. And to then feel guilty that you're still in pain is to turn energy in on yourself, which becomes a kind of a narcissism. I'm now preoccupied with myself because I can't get over this. Instead of saying, I can't get peace in this, I'm still dependent on God. But if we beat ourselves up for where we are around this process of forgiveness, we beat ourselves up, then we've got beat up energy in us that is just looking for someplace else to go. Does that make sense? <laughs> One of my colleagues, she always says, sometimes she'll say, you know, today I have a fight in me and I'm just wondering where I can put it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but like when you're hard on yourself, when you're being kind of mean to yourself or picking at yourself, well, eventually you're going to get tired of picking on yourself and that, that little critter is just kind of going, it'll go on to somebody else. So the thing is to start trying to tame uh, that little voice that, that shames us because we aren't forgiving. Forgiveness is a gift. If you don't have a sense of forgiveness, you haven't received the gift, and you need to keep praying more for the gift because it comes from God. Hmm. Um, I like to think about the temptations of Jesus in the desert. You know, different writers have spoken about Jesus' temptation. Some of you have preached on it, taught on it. I like to think of it as, the, as temptations, not just, um, you know, around hunger, and the need for power and the desire to be spared, but as temptations with many, many feelings. I mean, if Jesus is human, I think he was mad and sad and nervous and anxious. The scriptures are full of that. So sometimes the biggest temptations are all our feelings. You know, they just kind of come rushing in at us. Okay. Okay, in the book Premeditated Mercy, he, the author gives this wonderful, I thought, little image. He says, we need to become present to our own tears. If you don't honor your own wounds and tears, you'll never really honor another person's. Huh? You won't know your need for the Lord. You won't know the Lord's tears for us. Huh? But he says, but you have to hold a magnum of memories, like a magnum, a certain amount. You can only tap into a certain amount of pains and wounds because if you do so much of it, you'll drown in it, right? The purpose is not, in all of this, the purpose is not to go so into it that you end up feeling like a victim. But the purpose is to go into it, to know where there is pain, to understand humanity. And so he says, you go into your memories and you go into your feelings to a degree, to a portion, okay? So it just kind of puts a little uh, perspective on the, the, the balance, okay? Okay. So forgiveness is addressing our own wounds, our own spilled blood. It involves naming a loss of some kind. I think that's a piece that also gets lost a lot, that when we're in the process of forgiveness, do you focus more on your feelings, like I'm angry, I feel distant, I feel hurt? That's part of it, naming that and seeing where it comes from. 
but a big part of where those feelings come from is because usually we have lost something. You know, so, so much of um, the tension and the anger is we've lost something. We've lost trust in someone. Maybe we've lost trust in God. I remember when, when my brother died a few years ago, um, he died, he, he committed suicide. And I remember at the time thinking, well, now who's in charge of the world? And the, because it's like we lo I lost control of the world, and that was exactly what the pastor said at his funeral. He started off his homily and said, do you, <laughs> he said, do you really think God lost control of his own world last Friday? I want to say, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. But you know, when something painful happens, it's like nobody's in charge. You know, we lose, a, we lose our innocence, right? We lose a sense of naivete when painful things happen. So we get angry at God or angry at the person. We've lost a sense of security. And for anyone who follows Christ, you must lose your sense of security so that a true security in God that goes deeper and deeper can grow. Hmm? We lose confidence. We lose a sense of control. A lot of times we lose a sense of being special. You know, when spouses and children or your brothers or your sisters, they don't include you, they don't keep you up to date, they don't reach out, you lose a sense, I'm not that important. Hmm? So there's usually a loss when we're angry and sad. We lose a sense of belonging. I remember for many years a lot of my friends were single. I met them uh, when I worked for the diocese for the family life office, and a lot of them were single. They had been divorced. They were all single for years, and slowly, one by one, they, each of them got married, and I thought, no, I don't think I like them anymore, you know, because you know, what they were doing, they were living their own lives. <laughs> you know, they were becoming, like, really married, and they married people with kids, and they had more grandkids, and I thought, well, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> you know, but my sense of belonging to that group was dying. And so I needed to say, I'm angry, I'm sad. Why? Because I'm losing something. So the Lord's saying, I got another place for you to belong. And you can belong to them in a new way. And none of that happens without the, the dying and the death, right? And so all those, and you know, in some of the stories that we deal with and in your own life, sometimes what needs forgiveness is you've actually lost a person. Uh, or a home, or an immaculate sense, a country that was safe to live in. Sometimes forgiveness is about we're losing one's life. It's that Bernadine quote when he's crying. He says, I know, I'm sad too. I'm losing something, my life. I just got it back. I'm losing it again. Okay. So it's really important when we're struggling in this reconciliation process and dealing with the peace on forgiveness that we name the feelings, where they're coming from, Get some insight into ourself and the human condition. Find out what the loss is because then we need to bring that loss more consciously into prayer. Okay? Trying to watch this in my notes. I'm not real good at it. Okay, this is my favorite scripture. Uh, I didn't write it on here. It's Matthew 23, 13 through 39. <laughs> I've heard Brother Jim Zulo call this the scripture where Jesus loses it. Love that description. Okay, this, it's about the, the. It's in this scripture. It says the sevenfold indictment of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's when Jesus is so angry. Okay, Jesus is so angry. Okay, I love to picture Jesus this way. Alas for you, scribes and Pharisees! You are hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, neither going in yourself nor allowing others to go in who want to. Alas for you, you are blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, he has no force. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound. Fools, you're blind. Which is of greater value, the gold of the temple? Um, so he just he keeps going on swearing. And so just to take one line, he, in, in uh, Matthew's Gospel, each paragraph starts this way. Alas for you, scribes and Pharisees, you are hypocrites. You pay your tithe of mint and dill and cumin. Made me think of my own garden at home, you know. <laughs> you pay your tithes and then you neglect the weightier matters of the law. But to get back to the seriousness of his anger, it goes on and on. You are hypocrites. You clean the cup and the dish and you leave the people out. 
Again, you are hypocrites. You're, you have whitewashed tombs on the outside and you're dark inside. And he goes on and on, six, seven, eight phrases where he starts yelling at them, you are hypocrites. What is wrong with you? Don't you get it? Sounds like our family, right? Just, uh. <laughs> Not ourselves, of course, our family. It's so important to, to have that sense of Jesus losing it. But it's equally as important, and this is what uh, Brother Jim Zula pointed out to me years ago, the very, very next passage after Jesus is yelling and yelling and yelling and throwing the tables over, had it, the very next passage he sits down and he says, starts to cry. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets. You stone those who are sent to you. How I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks and her wings, but you refuse. Look, your house will be deserted, for I promise you, you shall not see me anymore until you are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You will not see me again until you are saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's us. That's the community of faith. But that, that juxtaposition of the anger is most often grief, most often grief. And how important it is to know that Jesus goes through that process to affirm and confirm our process and to tell us that is the way. Don't be afraid of your anger. Don't be afraid of your grief. I have gone there first, and I will take you where you need to go with it. And without it, all we have is trapped emotion, trapped energy, and trapped passion. Okay? So the danger in ignoring our own blood, our own anger, our own sadness, our own disappointment, um, you know, I had a, an, a, a lovely story once years ago. Um, many of my friends have had kids. Many of them had, had grand, were having grandkids. And I remember not having had children and, think, and listening to stories of my friends with children and finding that sad, happy for them, sad for me, disappointed about that. So we get through that wave, and then the grandkids' stories start. <laughs> which we all know are much longer than the children's <laughs> stories and happier. And I remember just feeling so sad, just so sad. I remember it was a Saturday night and I went out for a walk and just was feeling like this, almost like a barren woman. I felt so sad. And, you know, like a lot of times praying about that and walking with that and, you know, it's like, where do you go with it? You just are in it. You're just in it. So I went to sleep that night, and the next morning I went to Mass at St. Rose, my home parish, and my friend's daughter, who I've known for years and been in her confirmation sponsor in this and that, she comes up, up to me afterwards and she says, Maureen, David and I were thinking, she and her husband, she says, we want you to be the baby's godmother. I thought, very clever. <laughs> very clever, very clever, but I never could have gotten and you know this from your own life, I never could have gotten the intimacy of God hearing me and God gifting me if I hadn't also been in touch with the great wound. It's like when Immaculate says, thank you for putting the wardrobe in front of, th telling me to put the wardrobe in front of the door. It's like you, when you go into your wounds and you become, as someone said, so powerless, so vulnerable, then the power of God starts to show up more in our lives, right? It's in contrast to our own sense of helplessness. Okay, when we don't, when we don't name, you know this, our likelihood to blame other people, to scapegoat them, they are the ones, you know, if we don't name that we are bleeding and start taking that to prayer, that the pain of that uh, triggers trying to point, like Father Ben said, the pointing. They're all pointing at their woman, huh? And, and, of course, the rest of that scripture is then Jesus says what? Anybody else here make a mistake? That's my own little variation on the words, huh? Anyone, who here has not sinned? Anybody else here make a mistake? So the finger goes from this to this. And if it's, the finger is not, if we don't see it here, 
we're going to think it's there, right? That's the scapegoating mechanism. If we ignore our own bloodshed, also, later we find we're unable to identify with those who are wounded. You can't, it's not an intellectual thing, right? It's an emotional thing. Okay, the practice of blood, sweat, and tears. Forgiveness calls us to move beyond our own bloodshed then and move towards, towards giving blood to create new life. That's our whole theme, from bloodshed done to choosing to give blood. Huh? And this requires that we sweat and we wrestle. Hmm? And what we sweat and wrestle with, of course, are all the stories of faith, the vision of God that comes to us in the scriptures and from the cloud of witnesses that surround us. Huh? So we sweat and wrestle with the word. Um, just finding my place here. Um, Thomas Groom, who is a great religious educator, was a great religious educator, he talks about how the faith journey is a dialogue between our story, which is the little s, and the master story, the big S. Hmm? And all of us in spiritual direction have had a little review of this, that when we know our own woundedness, when we name it, when we go into it more, then the scriptures take on much, much uh, more significance in different places than they might have. So then I, I just put up several of these. It could be anything. But we are called to dialogue our small story with the master story. Huh? We are called to get in touch with what's going on in us and where has it happened first in the scriptures. Hmm? You know, whatever the story would be, what we're doing is sitting in the message of forgiveness. I started with how important it is to start with God's love, right? God's forgiveness, God's presence. Then we move into our story. Now we're back to God's story. So our story, going back to Father Ben's analogy, our story gets brought in under the cloak of God. It's, it's in between two, right? And I'm just going to go back to, again, in our culture, we have so much emphasis on the behavioral sciences, on knowing your feelings, communication, and all that kind of thing, that I think more often in the process of forgiveness and reconciliation, we know God comes first, we know our feelings count, we know we have to keep turning to the scriptures, but the envelope is what doesn't get enough attention. Does that make sense? The, 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 the beginning and the master story. So much emphasis, especially when we're struggling, goes on our story. Not done well necessarily. But feelings, come, they're like termites, they command, they're noisy, they command so much attention and that in the process we're called to put as much attention on where we begin and then where we're moving to, which means not just a thought, but reading and reading and reading the scriptures. Jan gave a, a, a great example. She talked about someone who was giving, who was struggling with forgiveness and reconciliation and she was given a penance to pray the Our Father and as she prayed it, to substitute the name of the person she was struggling with. Forgive me my trespasses as I forgive Jim. Forgive us our tre my trespasses as I forgive Mary. Forget and, and I love that example. It's like really bringing back the master story, not just the scripture, but the prayer and everything that's part of our faith, and letting that flood you. So if you think about times you've struggled with forgiveness, would you say you get flooded more by your feelings and your thoughts and your analysis? Or do you spend as much time letting yourself get flooded by the love of God and the, and the message in the scripture? Now, I just think, I uh, would just dare to say that certainly for myself and part of our culture, there's more flooding going on in terms of feeling and analysis then there is flooding going on of the beginning and the context and the call and the words of wisdom. Okay? And so I say to myself, so no wonder then that forgiveness is difficult because I don't put it in the uh, context of the process. Huh? Okay? The f so that, that part of us that doesn't move on, that part of us that doesn't move on easily, 
We could probably think of that in terms of our spiritual tradition. There's a false self that's going to have a resistance. We're going to hold on to hurts and pains and wounds, and we can make a God out of a person, an expectation, a situation, a dream, or the wounds themselves. Okay? So when you think about when you get stuck in the process, part of that examining, why am I having such a hard time with this, it's helpful to say, like with me, and make, making a God out of my friends, and that's why this is difficult. You know, my dependence and belonging needs to come from God. Am I in a marriage or in a situation with one of your kids? If it continues to eat at you, have you made a God out of the dream or the expectation of that child? And that, the pain is that there's been too much God-like energy put into that. Instead, the God-like energy has to go into the process of reconciliation, not the dream or the particular attachment. Does that make sense? Okay. Am I, am, are, am I, mm -hmm. That a lot of times, like with a marriage, with children, with situations in community, we want certain things. That's normal. That's human. They don't happen. And not only do they not happen, painful things happen. And we struggle with our feelings, and we struggle with the gospel's call to release this person from bondage, you know, in our mind. We struggle with that. When the struggle is continuous and very, very um, knotted up, it's often because we have actually made a God out of that vision of the marriage, that dream for the child, that expectation of the community. Does that make sense? The reason the forgiveness can be so difficult sometimes is because what we have lost had become a God for us. And then God is there to say, that image of marriage, that view for your child, that view for your life, yes, I understand. And yes, that's a painful loss. But that is not your God. I am your God. So the death of everything is about letting go of false gods which is why I think it's so important that we're naming our losses because sometimes the difficulty is we've, it, it has, they have so much energy, it's like a God in our life, okay? And so the vision of the, of the spirit in the word becomes like a bomb and a new stem cell to start creating new life, okay? This is Father Bin's quote from the book that he recommended for the class, and we thought it was so beautiful. We wanted to uh, bring it back. It says, once we understand in all humility that not everything happens that happens is about us or because of us, then personal sorrow need not and should not teach us to feel sorry for ourselves. Okay? It can and should teach us to feel solidarity with others. So it's that movement from wounds to the bigger story and part of how we continue to allow God to help us lose our grip is to remember that all sorrow and brokenness is about the human condition, huh? And not particular, not necessarily this particular person. Okay? So we wrestle, we're wrestling with life, and we are trying to let the true self take over, and the false self, which is a loved self, a human self, um, and as we can do that through grace, it leads to compassion and mercy. And this is what I was saying before. Compassion is when we respond to a concrete experience of suffering with which we can often identify from our own sensitivities. So someone betrays us, or let's say one of your siblings. Um, oh, this is a little sidebar. Most forgiveness and reconciliation comes fairly easy, I think, to parents with children. Fairly easy, not in the fact that it's not emotionally laden, but there's no doubt among 99% of parents that they want reconciliation with that child of theirs, that adult child, small child, because staying to being in union, you'll do anything. Is that not true? Okay, you'll keep, and you'll stay in a painful process. Usually in family, you, there's a drive to keep that reconciliation. But I think and for people of faith, it's to take that which you are uh, intuitively focused on in family and make it a way of life that includes everybody. That same desire that, that we would be one. Okay. 
So compassion responds to a concrete experience, like I understand how you're selfish. I understand how you could not come through. I understand how you could be tired and just not, you know, step up to the plate, et cetera, et cetera. You have an empathy because you know your own humanness. Okay? So compassion. I can have passion with you because I know that. Whereas mercy responds not to a concrete situation, but to just misery. And not necessarily that particular experience, but the general helplessness of the human person under the sway of original sin. Huh? Okay? You, you see that distinction? See that distinction? That compassion, you can move on in love for someone because you can understand their weakness. Mercy is, I don't understand the weakness. I don't understand the weakness, ex uh, the particular weakness. It's just that human condition is weak. It's about the human condition. It's the particular and the human condition, OK? Um, so mercy, I love this image. Mercy, then, is, has a condescending sense to it. And again, um, it's a forgiving love of an absolute, this is from Transformation in Christ. It's, I love this, it's a forgiving love of an absolute Lord who bends down to us without deserving it at all. It is a specifically divine virtue, an understanding of the weakness of the human person. It, it's that time in your own life. And I know you all have a story like this. It's that time in your own life where someone in your family or your community or your parish or your work, where you really get to where you say, forgive them, they know not what they do. And as Father Ben said, it's not personal. It's not about us. But it starts off personal. And it's supposed to. It's supposed to start off as a personal experience. And then it's supposed to, in our eyes, become a communal experience and then a universal experience because then that's the way of love. It goes from the personal to the larger to the larger community, okay? So if we, if we are merciful, this goes back to it's a gift. It's an imitation of God's attitude, okay? And then we just are reminded in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus says, I will have mercy. I will have that sense of compassion, even beyond compassion, what you don't understand, but you only understand that the person is part of the human condition as you are, and they have uh, offended just as we are capable of offending. Okay? This is a little poem I wanted to share from you from John Shea. It goes to the idea that mercy is God's bending down. Okay? Shea has this prayer, the God who fell from heaven, he says, if you had stayed, this is his prayer, if you had stayed tight-fisted in the sky and watched us thrash with all the patience of a pipe smoker, I would have prayed like a golden bullet aimed at your heart. But the story says you cried. And so heavy was the tear that you fell with it to earth, where like a baritone in a bar, it is never time to go home. A nice image of, of, of God's mercy. A tear up, wells up that God brings with his love. So the tears of compassion ask us to ask some questions. Tears, blood, grief, loss, sweating, the call to love as Christ loves. They put us in solidarity with others who are wounded. Ask the questions, when we're in this process, we need to be asking, whose lives do I, whose life, whose lives do I now understand better? What wounds or struggles uh, are going on in the life of the person I'm struggling to forgive? What wounds do we share? What does the experience of shared woundedness reveal to us about the love of God for us in Christ? So you see that movement from my experience, my feelings, my losses, ah, the Lord comforts those. Uh, wants to be my God, to not make a God out of the other person, wants me to become an ambassador. And as an ambassador, I'm called to grow in that mind of Christ and then move into a kind of a solidarity and a presence of compassion and mercy. OK? 
Okay, and that these are some of the kinds of things we ask ourselves, right, to participate in that process. I want to ask you to take a look at that handout I gave you from that Mother Teresa prayer. Do you see that one? It's the handout. On one side, it says the original version by Kent M. Keith. And the other side, it says this was found written on the wall in Mother Teresa's home for children in Calcutta. You got that? Um, look at the side that's by Dr. Kent Keith. I'm thinking that this is pretty familiar to you. Is that true? Like you've kind of seen this floating around. People are illogical, unreasonable, self-centered, love them anyway. Is that kind of familiar to you? Okay. Turn to the other side. Okay. Many of the lines that were by Mother Teresa's bed on the wall are similar. But look at the last two lines, which are different than the original, what she wrote. Give the best you have, and it will never be enough. Give your best anyway. Here's her line. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. <laughs> now, I've heard this, like a lot of you, many times, but I was sitting in church in Chicago uh, not that long ago, and I was sitting there kind of daydreaming during the homily. And, <laughs> and, the, and the priest read this last line. In the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. And I looked up, and I thought, that's it. It's just what you said, Sherry. It's not about whether someone else gets it. It's about our call to be ambassadors of Christ and ambassadors of reconciliation. So I'm just going to, being a poor manager of time, I'm going to just quickly go through, you know this from Khalil Gibran, he talks about the importance of tear and a smile, okay? The practice of blood, sweat, and tears, so now we're, remember we're using tears as tears of empathy, compassion, the tear of God, which is the tear of mercy, Reconciliation is the reestablishment of relationships from bloodshed to giving blood. And so we've had these different um, witnesses before us. And I'll just end with um, the quote from Martin Luther King, because I just want you to make that a scripture of your own if you don't have it already. It's on the orange sheet. And Martin Luther King wrote this in one of his essays, Love Your Enemies. Hmm? Uh, remember, you have to picture the 60s, the civil rights movements, the segregation laws, all the other discrimination that was institutionalized. Okay. He says, to our most bitter opponents we say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure suffering. We shall meet your physical force with soul force. So do to us what you will, and we shall continue to love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws, because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. So throw us in jail, we shall still love you. Bomb our homes and threaten our children, we shall still love you. Send your hooded perpetrators of violence into our community at the midnight hour, beat us and leave us half dead, and we shall still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer, and one day we shall win freedom, but not only for ourselves. We shall so appeal to your heart and conscience that we shall win you in the process and our victory will be a double victory. An ambassador of reconciliation. Not an ambassador of forgiveness alone. Not an ambassador of simply empathy and compassion. An ambassador of all of those. And as Father Ben said, that the emphasis is on the, the, the good of the offender. Okay? We want you to get it. We don't have control whether you'll get it, but we certainly hope and our hope is in being able to love like Christ. Um, I'm going to do just one. Oh, look at my old friend is back. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs>
Okay. Um, uh, God, going back to timing, God is always creating something. God is always, cre- we believe that, right? Creation wasn't a one-time thing. God is always creating something. Then God is creating in the places where we are struggling with, with forgiveness, to, to grow into the true self, with the waiting. God is creating something, which is why if forgiveness and reconciliation takes a long time, we are not called to get real preoccupied with the time. We are called to pray present to what is God creating in the process. Not the pragmatism of Americans. I want to get to the end because I want to be free of my emotions. I want to be in the process and I don't want to leave any bit of the process because God is creating something in each step of the process. And so I'll just end with this. Um, We might ask ourselves, what good or new life might God be creating in me as I await the gift of forgiveness? Something is being created in the process. The emphasis is not on the outcome. That's very American. I want to get done with this task. Something is being created in the process. And I love, I love when we come to Genesis 45 where Joseph makes himself known. Joseph the dreamer. So Joseph's brothers have all come to Egypt, and of course they don't recognize him, and he says, Joseph, or the scripture says, Joseph could not control his feelings in front of all his retainers, all the, the slaves. He exclaimed, let everyone leave me. And so no one was present with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that all the Egyptians heard him. Imagine the grief and the joy all coming up years later, huh? Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father really still alive? So this man who has not seen his beloved father all these years, his brothers could not answer him. They were so dumbfounded at seeing him. And then Joseph said to his brothers, his brothers who threw him in the hole, okay, left him for dead, Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. Oh, you who have offended me. Come closer to me. And when they got closer, he said, I am your brother Joseph, who who you sold into Egypt. But now, do not grieve. Do not reproach yourselves for having sold me here. (laughs) Since God sent me here before you, to preserve your lives. God sent me to this famine in this country, and there are still five more years of this. God sent me before you to assure the survival of your race on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. Okay, let's take a break. Thank you.